I introduced it at the beginning of the film, or at the class, so let me do it one more time. The film is called Jewel. And that came out in 1971 as a t television movie of the week in the United States. I actually remember watching this thing when it premiered. It's about 90 minutes long. Um, it does use some of the concepts of genre that we were talking about earlier. It also uses interesting, in a very interesting way, some of the things I was also asked to incorporate into today's class, and that is the use of sound. And there are a couple of terms to throw out to you, uh, diegetic sound and non-diegetic sound, if you've heard those terms. It comes from diegesis, and as far as filmmakers should be concerned, diegesis, diegesis simply means the story. And as you might imagine, diegetic sound is sound that is part of the story. It might be Foley effects. It might be, well, somebody speaking or it could be somebody talking. If somebody is playing an instrument in the story, that's diegetic sound. If somebody's playing a song in the story, that's diegetic sound. Non-diegetic, however, is when you start to mix in other effects especially sound effects. And one of the things that would be interesting to do, see if you can spot the first introduction of non-diegetic sound in Duo. It's really, in a way, amazing to watch this. I had not even thought of this that much until I was asked to do this for this class. I, there were a couple of spots where, yes, I paid attention to the music, and as I talked to you this morning to pay attention to the music, in terms of genre applications of music, it does do that too, and I've always taught those in the class, but I'd never paid attention actually to diegetic and non-diegetic use of sound in this film. And once I did, it again took me to a different level in the film, and I just looked at it again last night, and it exemplified one more time to me why it is such a, a primer in filmmaking. So see if you can spot the spot where, it come, where there's the first use of non-diegetic sound in the film. So that's one of the things I'd like for you to do as you're watching this. Uh, the other thing I like to do when I do work with this film is I like to go into the issue of plot points. Have you been introduced, do you know what a plot, plot point is, everybody? Usually a plot point in terms of your scripting and storytelling. It's a spot where the film takes a different path. It takes a turn in a different path. If you go by rules, normally they say there are five to eight major plot points in a film, in a 90, in a 90 to 120 minute film. So that might be something else I'd ask you to do too, to see if you can spot the uh, plot points in this film, the five major plot points. As I so, sort of told you this morning, you've got the first two given to you, which is the opening shot and the closing shot. But see if you can find the ones that are in between. And included in those shots in between is what uh, often is referred to as the inciting incident in terms of storytelling and scripting. And it's sometimes called a plot point, sometimes it's lifted out separately as a plot point, but it usually happens, especially in a, to a 90 to 100 minute film, it usually happens somewhere in the 18 to 20 minute range of the opening of the film. You'll have the inciting incident. And that is where the protagonists are the key participants in the film take a different track in the story. And once they have taken this track, they can never go back. And see if you can spot that, that position in the film. What is the scene and the shot? And actually, I'll give you a little bit of hint. It's probably about four minutes long in, in, in this particular film. Another thing to think about in terms of, of, of plot points is Normally, they are a sense of rising action that happens when you transition to a different act in terms of the screenplay or even in terms of, of the uh, shooting script. So if you can find out where the acts change, you can a lot of times be able to find out where the plot points are. And sure enough, this one operates just like a textbook. And you'll be able to see those plot points being used as transition points going from one act to the other. As I was just telling uh, some of your instructors, for the first time, actually, I was able to track down the scripts for this in the last couple of days. And I've got both the original, original script by the writer 
Richard Matheson, who, by the way, did a ton of film and TV work in the 50s and 60s, a number of it based on thriller-type films. And uh, I got his original screenplay, and I got the shooting script. Shooting script's way too detailed to bring, but I did bring along with me the original uh, script. And we'll be able to talk and see about how the filmmakers transitioned between what they envisioned on the script and then what they saw as possible on the film. So that'll be part of the things we'll do later. But for you, if you, would, if you wouldn't mind, try to find what you think are the plot points in the film, what you think is the inciting incident in the film, and also coming from today's lecture before this and discussion before this, try to find those elements of genre that you think apply to this film and which genres, I said plural, which genres are being used in this film. Okay? Like I say, it's about 90 minutes long. This is the film that made Spielberg's career. Uh, this is the one that made Hollywood take notice of him. And it says, to me, I've always enjoyed it. Uh, actually, I tend to like his early works. I, there's another film of his called Sugarland Express, which I like a lot. And it's all the, the late stuff, the, um, the stuff where he really tries to be an artist. That's the stuff I don't like. Uh, this is actually a, 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 a true film aficionado coming of age when you get a chance to watch this. Uh, I, uh, I do show this in my storytelling classes at, uh, at Mahidon, and some, most of the kids like it, some don't. I don't know if it's, the pace is too slow to a contemporary or modern audience. I shouldn't think it would be. Uh, as the title implies, it has scenes with lots of action, but it revolves around a car and a truck. And that, by the way, is the other thing I, I would also ask you to look forward to. And it caused something else that I put on the board earlier about those modes, those fictional modes. It's always a good idea if you're making a film and writing a script, not only just a good idea, it has to happen. Something has to happen to your central protagonist. They have to change. They should not be the same person at the end of the story as they are at the beginning. Something tangible and metaphysical has to happen to them or should happen to them to give the audience a bit of a payoff and also to make the character live beyond the immediate story. See if you can spot the transitions. Maybe even think in terms of those mythic mo or the mythic mode, the romantic mode, the high mimetic, low mimetic, and ironic modes that I put up there. Maybe even think and ask yourself how it applies to the protagonist in this film. Okay? So let's take a look at that. We'll take a break afterwards, come back, talk about it, then analyze it. All right? Do I need to cut off anything else? Okay. So did you were able to see several genre influences there? In fact, I think I gave you a little bit of overview. You've got a ton of stuff you can apply to this film. Um, by the way, how many of you sort of liked it? Anybody like it? Yeah? Did it? Too long. Oh, the, well, actually, the, the, it's so interesting, though, to talk about, especially from the standpoint of sound at the beginning and the way it moves through the film and the use of, of sound in the film. It is just utterly fascinating. Um, it really is like looking at a textbook on how to make a film. And remember, Steven Spielberg is a very young filmmaker when this is coming out and when this is showing. But what is the truck in terms of the movie? If, you're, if I'm asking you to explore the structure of this story, what is the truck? It's the bad guy. It's the antagonist. It's the ultimate antagonist. And it's a completely anonymous antagonist. Um, what else did you see in terms of that truck? Transformers at first? Well, was anybody shocked by the ending? Yeah. What about it? It does leave you. It does leave you. But it's also we'll get to it. I want to. One of the first things I want to do is look at our first plot point and our last plot point, and that will consist of the first and last shots. And you're really going to understand what this movie tried to achieve and how it achieved it. But again, who was surprised? Anybody else surprised about 
the last scene there, the last scene with the truck. You were expecting an explosion. Why? Because well, it's a it's a gasoline truck, and it says flammable on it. And so you're sitting there, boy, this is going to be a great explosion, and nothing happens. Instead, instead, this thing dies. And you know, there's a there's a word for that, anthropomorphic. When you give human qualities like to animals, you say you anthropomorphize the animal. Here they've anthropomorphized the truck. The truck is the antagonist, and the truck has taken on human characteristics. It's not so much the driver we're fearful of, it's that truck that turns its lights on and looks at you with eyes in the tunnel. It's the truck that talks to the train when they actually, you hear them going down the road, one sounds its horn and the other answered. It's like two machines talking to each other, conspiring against this little bitty vehicle. So that's what you would call anthropomorphizing the truck. And at the end, it doesn't explode. It sort of dies. And in fact, there's that little drip of the oil that comes down. In fact, I, I, one of my students in my other class looked at this and said, well, you can see the, the driver's blood bleeding. I said, no, no, it's the oil. It's the oil in the car. The truck is what's bleeding, not the driver. <laughs> well, they would have to because there's nothing left of that truck, and that was a real truck, I guess. And I don't know. Actually, I, I don't. One thing I don't know, I don't know too much about the production history of this thing. I read on it a little bit, and apparently it was a limited area, as you can imagine, shooting this thing. It was fairly remote, even though you still saw lots of cars and trucks on the road, relatively speaking. Uh, I did read about Chuck's Cafe, which is it's been turned into a French restaurant. And that's just wrong. That's just wrong on so many levels <laughs> to, to, to put that place. But you can apparently still go to most of these places. So OK, we've got a story here that's pretty doggone efficient when you think about it. It boils down to a central protagonist and an antagonist. And we watch these two battle and struggle against each other hardly without anybody else interfering the entire film except for an interesting backstory. And uh, maybe we can start to roll a little bit here. I'll tell you, first of all, I'll, no, let's not do a plot point yet. So let's, let's get into the character of David Mann first. Um, start to roll it a little bit here. On, on, yeah, I'll get the lights here. And I want to go from the opening until about the first 10 minutes. And we'll... Roll it up to the to the opening shot. Just yeah. Back further, 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 further. Okay, right there. That's fine. Don't worry about the opening shot. We'll come back to that later. Now, roll it without sound. What does it look like? Where are we? Looks like suburbia. car scene. You mean a, a point of view. It is a, it's a POV from our hero. Although we go almost like six minutes, I think actually five minutes and 35 seconds before we actually see our protagonist. This thing runs along with all these POV shots from the car. We start out with an anonymous shot of the protagonist just like we eventually have an anonymous shot of the antagonist here. And there's a sort of this balance that's created too. But you start to look at this, and here as we go through this passageway and this tunnel, and what's happening here is that we are really leaving urban life. And this is what I was telling you when it shifts to having some of the conventions and iconography of the Western, this is how it happens. We pass from this suburban existence, and it's not a city existence really, it's really not urban, it's suburban. This guy. Dennis Weaver, who plays the role here, and that's, by the way, very, very important for this film. We'll get to that at the end of this segment when we talk about it. He comes from a suburban background and not an urban background. What's the significance of that? Because what type of guy is David Mann? Can you tell me a little something about him? What's he like?
Maybe he's too sensitive. <laughs> Anybody feel good about this guy at the beginning of this thing? What do you feel about him? Do you feel comfortable with him or not? Well, as not here. Wait, we'll see him. Actually, we'll see him almost from the very first shot. But by the way, I'm I'm just going to show you the opening here, is because through the credits, what they're getting these series of dissolves, and they are taking you out into the west. They are taking you into the badlands. That's where you're going from this. And this quickly. Here, I think they're actually getting baseball scores at this point. But here, this transitions from the suburbs to the wild, wild west, for life is not safe, and where expectations that you may have about what is secure in life are frequently not met. So let's run it up. Well, let's. I don't feel the same. It's like this is the last case. Well, just as. I Because one of the things you don't have, stop it right there. Here, this is where I like to stop it. One of the things you don't have out here, you don't have help. This is empty. It's utterly empty. Car breaks down. In fact, I, I've got to tell you, I remember when I used to travel, drive from Texas to, to California and used to get warnings. You know, make sure you're carrying enough water with you in case your car breaks down <clears throat> so that you don't get stranded and die out here in the middle of the desert. Uh, because it gets really hot too, and people used to actually carry water on the on the fronts of their car as well. But here's a wonderful iconic shot that has all the elements of the West. Here's the the barren, desolate, treeless aspects of the West you're usually finding, and of course the mountains. And there's something else going on here too. What else do you see in the picture? The car, the car, but what else? There's something else big in the picture. Barbed wire, barbed wire, uh, which is an encroachment of civilization. But when you think about it, the West is supposed to be the symbol of freedom. It's supposed to be the symbol of renewal and opportunity, like I was telling you at the beginning of class. This is why people go West. Because you can put off your old baggage, your old social baggage, all your failures, and you can start over brand new, and you've got total freedom. Here, there's only one place where there's freedom left. It's on the road. Everything else has been fenced in by barbed wire. You know, in Texas, we actually have a barbed wire museum. You would be surprised how many types of barbed wire there is. Lots and lots of types of barbed wire. But here you get it, and here you get this symbolic car in some ways. And I did read about that. Spielberg was very insistent that the film use a red car. It may have been coincidence that it was a Plymouth and that it was a Plymouth Valiant. Of all the styles and names to have is a Plymouth Valiant. That goes, you know, it's almost like Prince Valley here. Okay, keep running now. We're about to get our first shot of him, I think, here in just a second. Or maybe we go through a series of dissolves first. But this is all the Western background. And again, you see lines of barbed wire fences, different from how you imagine the traditional rest. Yeah, here's, the, here's a series of dissolves. By the way, I like this. This is multiple dissolves. I think are really, really effective when it goes through this. And this, of, just pause it one more time. That's, of course, a typical Hollywood montage. You may have studied in film theory about montage with Soviet filmmakers like Eisenstein that use montage for a different purpose. Here, Hollywood montage almost always does a lot of multiple dissolves, and it's used to condense time. So we have a clear indication or a clear sense as a member of the audience that time has passed. And we've seen it on the screen condensed into a few seconds. OK, keep going. Again, a system, uh, clear a montage. And then, but what I'm really interested in seeing here is the first time we're going to be introduced to our character. And it's after rolling in all of this wasteland, all of this emptiness and spaces, all alone here. This is a guy completely alone in, his circum in these circumstances. 
Only thing you don't have at this point is cactus. Okay, I think we're about to get it. The shot's going to drop down to the rear view, or right up to the mirror of the mirror, and pause it. There's our protagonist. There's something interesting about introducing your protagonist this way. What? What do you make of a sh introducing a character like this? Think about how we saw John Wayne in The Searchers coming out of the horizon until he gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Here, we don't even have this guy's full face. And we have a reflection. We don't have a full-on facial shot at all. We have a reflection. And by the way, notice how many times in this film Spielberg will fr frame the character. And by the way, what's the protagonist's name? Did anybody notice? David Mann. Obvious symbolism. Intentional symbolism. Man. Every man. Uh, the simplicity of David, but he is supposed to be an every man. So if we're starting off this film and we're looking at it, remember those fictional modes? Which fictional mode does David Mann belong in here? Do you think? Which one? The low mimetic. Absolutely. He's at the bottom of the totem pole here. This is your low everyday man. This is not even a high mimetic person. And we're going to find it as the backstory becomes revealed. There's a backstory in this. For, the, for all of the fact that there's only two characters mainly explored in the film, the protagonist and the antagonist, Spielberg actually does a pretty masterful job here of giving you and revealing to you a backstory. And I don't want to go back and show it and find the audio, but you may remember part of it is hinted at as the guy is listening to the radio. He's listening to a guy in the radio. And the guy in the radio is what sort of, if you remember, he's a guy who's staying at home. He has become a house husband. Yeah, it's the radio show. It's AM radio, that's what they're listening to. It's diegetic sound. It belongs to the story. And in fact, when you listen to this, basically, for the first 18 minutes, it's all diegetic sound. There is no non-diegetic sound at all. Every single sound, uh, music, effect, is diegetic. It's only with the arrival of the inciting incident that you have the insertion of non-diegetic sound. And that's why, and then from that point on, non-diegetic sound is going to grow and grow and grow and it's going to dominate the entire film by the end where there's almost no diegetic sound left. It really is, when I listen to this thing, when I watch and listen to this, how many of you have listened to Ravel's Bolero? You, ever, you know the musical piece Bolero, the Ravel? how it's the same song, the same passage that, that starts off very slowly and gently. And it, for, for 18 to 20 minutes, it steadily gets louder and more forceful as more instruments come in. Something of this, this is almost like listening to a, and watching a visual bolero on this film. Because there's going to be a crescendo. A crescendo not simply of sound moving from diegetic to non-diegetic, but also the character's emotional state, and the action as well. It's all going to sort of follow this pattern. But right here, this is our introduction to the character. And I still want to ask you, what's he like? If he's a low mimetic character, and there is a hint to his character with that radio show with the house husband, what does that tell us about David Mann here? Pete? Peter? What do you think? What do you think of this guy? If you're walking, let me ask you one question, Peter. If you're walking down a dark alley and it's five in the morning and you don't know what's around you, do you want this guy on your side? 
You do? <laughs> you do? Um, well, there could be an answer. I mean, you, you, if you run faster than this guy, <laughs> then your problems are solved. <laughs> you know that old saying about the people being chased by the bear? And the bear isn't saying, you know, what are we... <clears throat> What are we going to do? What are we going to escape the bear out? And I said, it doesn't matter. All I have to do is be, run faster than the slowest guy in the group. <laughs> and that's what you have with Dave Mann. Dave Mann here is not the world's strongest figure, a virile, masculine hero here, is he? Run it up a little bit further. A couple more shots here, and we'll see him full face, finally. Yeah, the meat, I, I don't know, that's just absurd. Okay, stop it here. Yeah, that, that's, uh, I'm, yeah, some guy plays meat. <laughs> but I love this shot. I absolutely love this shot. Because it's also telling you a whole lot about the guy. Who drives like this? Anybody here drive a car? You? <laughs> People don't drive like this. You drive like this. <laughs> but no, all the way through this guy, this guy, he's uptight. He follows the rules. He's afraid to take chances. It's there in his, his body posture and in the gestures and in the performance of this character right here. Which is why this is such a, and he's sitting there, you, know, you can just see it. The guy is, is, is oozing out weakness. He's not, he's a weak, very weak character at the beginning here. And uh, he's almost afraid to laugh. And then we're about to get something, where, by the way, where are we on the time code? Uh, no, no, on the, on the. We are four or five minutes. Okay, keep going. Yeah, there it is. Five minutes were uh, about that, when, like I say, before we meet him. There again, look at the body posture. Upright. This is a guy like he's following the textbook from the California driver's license book and he never alters it one bit here. And then, poof. I ask you about the inciting instant. Stop it right here. Well, back it up the truck. This is the first time we see the truck. And remember what I said about the inciting incident? How I defined it? What did I say it was? Inciting incident. And it's like, let me show you how it's spelled. It's not insightful. See if you can see it right here. It's the point where the story really takes off. Where, as I told you, there is a turn in the story. It's usually, it could be considered a plot point. It often is. Where the story never cannot go back. Can, at this point, the story can never go back to what it was before. What do you make of this incident with the truck here? Does it have that sort of significance here? What do you think? Nothing. Nothing here. No. Not yet. No, not yet. It's just a truck on the road. And I think he, uh, yeah, go ahead and start playing again with that sound. And he gets up and finds it. In fact, as we watch this, yeah, we know the name of this thing is Jewel, but we don't really know that this is all that significant. This is a guy just getting irritated by pollution at this point. Until... Something happens here in just a couple of seconds. This should change your mind. It should change your psychology and your reaction to the film. And then you're going to know, it may not be the inciting instant, but you're going to know that this truck has a lot more to do with the film than simply being something else he's passing on the road. Let's see. I think we're about to get it right here. Here we go. Watch the camera track. 
OK, freeze it. And here we have it. Dirty, filthy, anonymous, low angle shot so that this thing looms over you almost. And this is going predominantly be the way this truck is shot for the entire film. So almost from the very beginning, it is anthropomorphized or made into something seeming to have a little bit of human qualities. Because the only thing we see of the driver ever, the bare arm, where he waves him past here. OK, keep going. And by the way, the sound here is starting to get interesting, too. You can put up a little sound to it. Because the truck announces itself as something special because the sound associated with the truck starts to fill the screen more, too. And there he is, of course, stuck. I love that. We actually get a double shot there here. Again, at this point, the sound is all, di is all still diegetic. And that sound from the rad AM radio persists a lot through this film. Uh, even at a certain point where other sort of sound forces are taking effect, we still sort of hear the radio, but it's sort of fading out. There we go again. Now we're starting to say, what the heck is what's going on here? Because now it's even upset him. And this guy doesn't get upset. Why? Because this guy is a wimp. <laughs> That's what he is. When you look at what David Mann is, he's got an iron press shirt. He's driving by the rules. He's even complaining about pollution in 1971. <sighs> he's a wimp. And we start to hear that, like I say. The reason I introduced that is because part of that's a backstory that we see. And I think to get the first talk here too, don't we? That's about as clear as we ever see the driver, I think. OK, now we're starting to ratchet this uh, thing up. OK, lower the sound. And what you're starting to see here also with the driver is, with David, you're starting to see an evolution of emotional states. First of all, he's irritated by the pollution. Then he's antagonized. <clears throat> then he's going to become angry. Then you're going to have episodes where the truck is going to find him. He's going to be becoming fearful. In the Chuck's Cafe, he's going to become paranoid. He goes through a whole variety of emotional states. It's a bravura performance by the actor, Dennis Weaver. But like I say, a little bit about his background here is revealed. And we're about to get a little bit more here. When he does one of these things that always drive you crazy. Think about the logic of this. He's been fighting for space on the highway with this truck. And he's finally got it away, clear and away. He's, he's, he's got in the lead here. He's not in any problem. And he decides to turn off the road and get gas. Why? Now, here's something really interesting to shop. Stop it and let me explain. I told you Spielberg is interested in feel, filling this, this film with a lot of Western iconography. You're about to see it used right here. Let me tell you a little bit about Dennis Weaver. He was very widely known to American TV audiences. For about 20 years, he played a character called Chester Good in one of the longest running American westerns on TV called Gunsmoke with Matt Dillon and Miss Kitty and all the rest. <clears throat> and Chester was sometimes, a, he was a helper, sometimes a, a, a deputy. But Chester always walked with a limp, like this. That was the, what the character did. He walked with a limp. Now, most of the audience in 1971 are going to remember that because I think Gunsmoke went off the air in 1969 or 70, just a couple of years before this TV movie was made. And at that point, Dennis Weaver, by the way, got a different role, which some of you may have heard of as well. He played a character called McLeod for about five or six years on TV. McLeod, he was either Arizona or New Mexico sheriff who goes to New York City, which sounds an awful lot like 
Clint Eastwood and Coogan's Bluff, which may have inspired it because it came out a year after. That series started in 1970, one year after Coogan's Bluff with Clint Eastwood. But anyway, what I'm, my point is here is all American audiences this time associate this man with Westerns and with Western characters and with sheriffs and with law enforcers. And they also associate him with Chester Good, who limps through his scenes. Now continue to play. And you're going to see something really interesting. Just showing you that, that Spielberg knows it, and he's going to remind you. And I'll call you, yeah, here's the truck coming in, too. <clears throat> and at this point, by the way, you're starting to get really, yeah, something is wrong here. And he should have figured it out as two. But we're about to get the backstory revealed in addition. We've got three things going on here. We've got tension caused by the truck arriving on the scene. We've got this allusion on Spielberg to the Western hero. And we're about to also get the backstory revealed. Oh, turn up. Sound. Western iconography, going strong there. Want me to check on the hood for you? Uh, also his nature, a little bit of his nature revealed there in the apartment, jumpy and skittish. Now watch this. Here's a little bit about the backstory. What did he just say? He said, the guy says, you're the boss. And he says, not at my house, I'm, I'm not. And we're about to see that enacted in the telephone call in just a few minutes. And did you see him walk? See the guy walk with a gimp? That's Spielberg's allusion to his role by having this guy limp through it. Everybody watching this in 1971 thought of that. Trust me. Now we get this. And I love this too. Pause it. Uh, go back. Where he puts his, his leg on the... On. There. Look at that pose. What do you make of the pose? Remember we talked about him being a wimp? Is this a wimpy pose? No. This is what a guy does to try to establish a sense of manly authority. Right? And watch what happens here. Roll it. He puts his leg up, and fat lady comes through and has to push it right back down again. And watch him crumble, literally his body posture and everything else in the performance. He leans against the wall. He looks for support. And then we get the whole story of his back life. And pause it. What's his relationship with his wife? What? Who's? What's, what's, his, what's his relationship to his wife? What, are their, what is their life like together? Can't see people when they're in front of me. It's all right, I'll turn it on. Well, what's their life like together? Well, a lot of though you can see by his body language. Look at his body language. Uh, 
he's trying, he's, what he is, he's reporting in to his wife. And the odd thing is, she doesn't care. <laughs> what are you calling me for? Well, I just wanted to call you, dear. And that's the way he says it, too. He has this whine in his voice. It's, it's, the performance is just absolutely excellent at revealing the backstory here with the ultimate amount of efficiency. We don't, have, we don't spend a whole lot of time having somebody tell us that David Mann is a wimp. We see it. We see it in the, in the foreshadowing with the, t the radio show. We see it with the foreshadowing just a few minutes ago with who's at the boss of the house. And then we see what their life is like right here. Okay, run it for a little bit further. Maybe turn it up. And by the way, here we, are, we have a lens. I'm sorry about last night. Oh, I really don't want to talk about it. Well, don't you think maybe we ought to? No, because if we talk about it, we'll just get into a fight. You wouldn't want that, would Stop you? Stop it. There we go. You're not a guy who stands up for himself. You won't fight for me at the party. You're a wimp. And this is where we're starting in, the, in this story. This is where we're starting with David Mann. On that list of fictional modes and the characterization of the hero, he's right at the bottom. He is low mimetic. He is average, everyday guy who is being stepped on by everybody around him. My gosh, he's driving a Plymouth Valiant. He's a salesman on the road. His wife and children kick him around. And now, he's, this is like the guy who goes to the beach and the bully kicks sand in his face. That's what the truck driver is going to do. And that's what causes the transformation. That's what makes this an interesting story. Because by the end of this film, David Mann is no longer this guy. He has achieved something of heroic status. In fact, when I look at those fictional modes, think about it. Where do you put him at the end? Can we go to the very end? Last shot? Uh, Lens flare. No, no, just get me to the lens flare. There. What? I think he's, this is dead romantic. This is dead romantic. This is how you see heroes pictured here. Literally with a crown projected. That's what this lens flare is for. It used to be difficult to get a lens flare. You couldn't do it with just a computer. <laughs> they actually had to do this the hard way. <laughs> so this is all very, very intentional to create this moment. And by the way, I didn't see that. That is a, uh, it's, it's, it's being the dissolve is you, being used right there where you stopped it. See if you can go just a little bit further, Georgie. Actually, I hadn't noticed that until now, that it has the, the dissolve is that extensive. OK, here. Compare this to that last shot of the searchers. Here's a guy who had to use the same tools that John Wayne had used. He had to step away from civilization, and he had to become a savage to defeat the savage. And in so doing, he's become transcendent. He's become something a lot bigger than he was. He's become this romantic hero. He shot through all those modes. He's gone from low to high to romantic. And that's always what makes the story interesting, is when the hero is a non-static hero, a hero who grows. Because, as I told you too, by the time you get to the end of the story, something needs to have happened to your hero in order for people to care and to want to know anything about this guy. You don't want to just leave here. This is actually a far better conclusion. Even though we think, we tend to think of the conclusion of this film as the, the truck going over the edge, maybe this is why there is no explosion. I don't know. I've thought about it. Maybe this is why there is no explosion, because if there were, it would destroy the shot. 
We would be thinking about the explosion of the truck, the flammable truck, but instead we're left, I think, with this last shot instead of the truck. And that's what the filmmaker wants you to remember, is what has happened to this guy in the course of this film. Now, take it back to the very first shot again. Let's remember where we were at the end of this thing and where we opened up at. Is that the first? I think it's actually a little... Okay. <clears throat> this always helps, too. Compare your first shot and your last shot. These, are, I told you, are two plot points. Your first plot point and your final plot point are there in the first shot of the film and the last shot of the film. Compare them. Oh, sure. Well, there's a lot of them. And as I also said, there's a lot of stuff that comes out of this, like uh, Road Warrior and Mad Max that comes out of this later on. They, they pick up on this. But yeah, there's a lot of mythic themes that can be woven into this. That's what a good film does. Yeah, it's, it's biblical. Yeah, it is. Yes. Yeah it's, it's, it, oh, yeah, it's definitely got the, the, the biblical quality. But again, from our standpoint of story, and of course, what does David become? He moves from being a shepherd to being king. He moves from being a boy to being a man. So yeah, all of this stuff works. And here, we've got stylistically the opening of this is what? Compare the last shot to the first shot again. Name all the differences between the two you see. Alex, name me, give me a couple of differences between the first shot and the last shot. The first shot is the way the routine is counting. Root, this is routine, yeah, okay. It's routine, it's the uh, uh, boarding garage, it's like so, and the last shot is like a uh, wild light, and the uh, uh, main character seen like, I don't know, wolf who start the hunting. Well, remember what we do have different here. Difference too. Here we have a POV at the beginning, an anonymous POV. By the end of it, what do we have? It's not a POV anymore. Instead, it's an objective camera shot. We've moved away from the camera. David has moved away from the camera. He is the subject of the camera now instead of being part of it. That's an important difference in terms of the way we relate to the character. Because remember here, he's also anonymous here at the beginning. Just like the truck driver is through the entire film, he's also anonymous here at the very beginning. And by the end of it, we know exactly who he is and what he is. And therefore, the camera shifts from POV of David to an objective POV, from a subjective POV. And yeah, you guys, you, you all guys know what subjective POV and objective POV, right? Okay, so we shift from subjective POV to objective POV by the end of the film. Who is that looking at at David at the end of the film. Who is that looking at David with that lens flare with the golden hue around him at the end of the film? Looks like a big storm. <laughs> but who is that looking at David at the end of the film? It's, a, it's an objective POV of who? Of who? Of you, actually. You. You're, it's your point of view. Your point of view has become the dominant point of view at the end. And you are looking up at this figure. Literally, you are looking up at this figure, which has changed dramatically from the beginning. When it's a subjective POV, where you're sharing the same eyesight and line of view as David at the beginning of this thing. What else? Lena? Lena? What else do you see as different comparisons between the two? Yes, absolutely. Got it in one, again, from darkness into light. You don't usually start a film in darkness. That's an odd thing to do. 
I can think, well, go back and look at the searchers. You've got at least landscape. Here you've got this paranoid world of the suburban garage and blackness. And you literally go from darkness into light. Again, the shift, this, is, this supports what's happening to the character. Visually, you're supporting how the character's nature is being changed. What else? It squeezes him. In fact, again, we get the idea that, especially when we look back, that this is a guy with lots of pressure on him. Lots and lots of pressure, almost to the point of being, exp you know, this is what happens when you got wimpy guys. You keep pushing them too far, and all of a sudden, they do exactly this. They either melt down or they explode. And David explodes and achieves a sort of ri ritual, a rite of delayed entry into manhood, in a way. Because that's what's going on here, too. Let me see where we are. Actually, my voice is getting tired. How much time? Let's go a couple more minutes, then we'll take another break. <clears throat> Let's now try to figure out what the inciting incident is. Let me take this off. Let's check out this off. Let's go back and try to figure out what the inciting incident was. When did this film change and change to the point that it could never go back to the story it was before this particular point? Did anybody figure it out? I, again, the hint is when you first heard the use of non-diegetic sounds. Spielberg does that. There's another plot point here where he actually makes a ding, ding, ding sound. It's almost like, you know, here we go, plot point, ding, ding, ding. And he does it right at the first inciting incident, too. Did anybody catch it? It's subtle, but it's there. Where does this movie really change? When, when does he pass it? Because he passes it a lot. That's it. Good. Excellent. Excellent. Literally, we talk about taking a path. Here's Spielberg. For gosh sakes, he's doing it visually. I tell you, you take a path in the story where you can never go back. And literally, this is what David Mann does. He takes a path around the truck. He, goes an alter he uses an alternative to the road. And once he does that, this story changes. It takes it to about 18 minutes. Actually, 17.20. They're right here. Now play it. Did you hear it? Pause. Did you hear it? For the very first time, we had the mixture of that string sound. It's the very first time. It's almost, if you're paying attention, this is Spielberg making an announcement. Guys, the story's just changed. And it's a funny thing. I always go crazy when I watch this because I could swear when I saw this that David said, he tried to kill me. And I've always heard that. I've heard that for like 35 years now. He tried to kill me. I've always thought that was in the film. And I've played it back recently, and he doesn't say it. And then I looked at the original script, and he does say it in the original script, the Matheson. Uh, I don't know if I was imagining it or what, but it is at this moment where the script changes. He, well, let's see if I can find it there, Georgie. Just, you know, you want me to also put it on yeah, let me see if I can find it real, real quick. I 
I think it's page 15, beginning of Act 2. Or maybe at the very end of Act 1. Page 14? Yeah, actually page 13. Go to page 13. And here what we're going to see here is what we just saw. Uh, yeah, 13. And let's see. Line 67. Here we go. His expression hardening to one of vengeful satisfaction. Well, it's about time, Charlie, where he's just giving him the motion to go around. He twists the steering wheel, accelerating towards the line, and instantly his face goes blank with a shock. Go up. PO view, other lane. Camera zooms in, blues the camera. Here it is. Gasping, he jerks the steering wheel down, and he's got to, I think he says it somewhere. Keep going, keep going. Am I imagining it here, too? I thought he said it there, too. Hold on. There it is. My God, my God, he wanted me to hit that car head on. He is saying here he wants to be, but we don't hear that. That, li that line is missing from the film. Now, it's, what's important about that to me is we're starting to see what Spielberg does well, and I've got another example of that in the film. And everybody who's a filmmaker pay really close attention to this. Anytime you can depict something visually instead of using dialogue, you do it. And here we get, to, we get to see that. We get to see it with the expression on his face and his reactions. We don't hear, I don't think we hear this. Yeah, right here? Man's thought, man's thought incredulously. Not only meant for me to be killed, but a totally innocent passerby as well. And like I say, I think I've heard that in my own mind for 35 years. But I haven't seen it in the passage on the film. And then I find out that it actually was there in the original script. So it just goes to show you how things play with it. But anyway, this does show you also how Spielberg took script and translated it into images, the fact of what we saw. And this is the inciting instant. So let's go back to the inciting instant and watch it again. Watch it all the way through. OK, play it now, Georgie. Right here. This is fine. Yeah, go ahead. This is lengthy, but that's what it's supposed to be. Oh, and yeah, pause it. And again, buy the book, 18 to 20 minutes in, 20 minutes into the film is where you have your inciting instant. Where are we on the time code, Georgie? There you go. Play. And all the dialogue we saw, gone. <laughs> Come on, you miserable fat head. Get that fat ass truck out of my way. OK, take sound down. I would argue that all of this is not only the inciting instant, but this is also an extended plot point, second plot point to the film that we find here. And it leads us all the way, basically, to Chuck's Cafe. And it becomes a transition point. I would argue, I've always taught this as a transition between scene one and scene, I mean, excuse me, act one and act two. According to the original script, it's act three and act four, I think. But the point is, you can read, the way the original script is written, you can actually see the first two acts are essentially like one act. So even though it's in six acts, you can think of this as a three act uh, film, teleplay. And this becomes an extended scene of rising action, of rising tension, going into the second scene. And that's how you're supposed to have a plot point. That's normally where they do occur. So we have a combination here of in the inciting instant and the plot point, where he go, and here's the inciting instant, where you can never do anything, you can never take another path because David has chosen a different path. And watch this. 
Get ready to cut it right here. Run it back a little bit. This, yeah, to, right here. This is fine. Pause it when he looks like a, a maniac beating on his. <laughs> I love that shot too. There. <laughs> yeah, he's for the first time in his life he's won something. You know how many people you know wait never won a dad gum thing in their entire life and here he's finally won something. He's finally proved himself. He's proved his mettle. He's proved his manhood. But in so doing he's taken a different path. And this is where the inciting incident comes to the close and comes to its highlight. And then the rest of the scene becomes an extension for about five, four or five more minutes, minutes leading to Chuck's Cafe, which is the entire plot point. So I would say in this one, the inciting incident is embedded into the second plot point. Okay, keep going. I'll point something out to you here in a minute too. A little continuity error, <coughs> I think. May go a little bit, a uh, little bit longer here. Push it up a little bit faster, Georgie. Yeah, Chuck's Cafe. Right when the truck's going to come behind him here. Here's the first time we get this sense of series of intercuts that create tension here with this truck, and we start. This is really nicely done here, and of course it echoes the end of the film too. We get a sense of parallel structure to the story. There's a big chase scene at the beginning, and there's a big chase scene at the end. So you get parallels in story structuring. But I'm going to look for, as you're watching this scene, keep looking at his right rear tail light. And I just point this out for the fun of it. It gets damaged before the truck ever hits him. And then it gets fixed in the film somehow, magically, later on. But this, keep looking here and you'll see the damage. I also think they got three or four different cars here that they're using in this, uh, in the movie too. I think this was shot in about two weeks, believe it or not. Because there's a, gosh, I don't know how many setups and shots there are. Again, another use of mirror shot there. Here it looks okay. We'll take a break right after this, I promise. I know you're getting tired. But this, closing up, look how he creates tension by doing this. You think he's going to hit him now, he's going to hit him now. But Spielberg stretches the moment. He actually stretches the moment. This is what creates tension. And it's done through the editing process. Again, he's going to hit him, he's going to hit him. And then shot in the mirror. But the moment is stretched out. It's the exact reversal of the Hollywood montage, which is used to condense. Gosh, he's a bad driver. Uh, you can control a car better than this. Trust me, I've driven 90 miles an hour in a, <laughs> down country roads. <clears throat> there we go, look at the damage. Did you see it? And you go a little bit further, it actually is even more damaged. But it's a nice little continuity error. You want to show them the last one, the continuity error, before we take a break? It was at the snake uh, snake about 55 minutes in, I think. Yeah, start there, start there. I'll let him go around and... Uh, yeah, you don't need the sound. Oh. And you, she does, by the way, tell him at this point, he does sort of explain away something here that's weird. He says, boy, that's a strange place to have a, a telephone booth. Tell me about it. That's the weirdest place in the world to have a telephone booth. That's the filmmaker explaining away a, a little probably a problem in the, in the storyline right there, because it's just too weird to be true. Okay, let's watch here for the pause at Georgie. You know where it's coming up. See it? You see anybody see anything here? <laughs> Right there. There's the camera. <laughs> That's him, yeah. Now, watch the, now, this is really interesting, too. 
play it, play it forward, Georgie. We're going to get a cutaway here. You can actually see him, see the movement there. Yeah, he's got it. He's he's clocking it. Now, look, look it's fixed. <laughs> Take a break. We'll come back and, and sum this up because I know it's getting late. It's uh, what time is it now? Gosh, 4:25. Actually, we're yeah. Actually, okay. All right. Okay. We'll just go through the last couple of plot points really quickly. Yeah, take us back to 3930. We'll actually come to the, back to this. Uh, we're about to see another, this is actually another plot point. 3930. Actually, I got the wrong time here. Here, oh yeah, here, that's where I want, that's where I want actually, Georgie. Yes, yeah. I, I, it should have been 49.30. Should have started, through. I got the, got the wrong thing. Okay, this is the third plot point, I would argue. And it's not so much the action that accompanies this of the fight. And by the way, after, the fight's important here. Don't discount it because after you've, been through this in long, incredibly long interior monologue listening to David Mann's thoughts, you're wanting something to happen. And they do something, by the way, fairly neat too. At one point, you remember when the waitress comes up and drops the silverware on the, on the uh, it shocks you. Yes, it shocks you. And it's really strange because usually non-diegetic sound, like mood music, is used to shock you. But in this case, it's diegetic sound. The sound of silverware that does belong in it is what is used to shock you out of this entire extended non-diegetic sequence. Anyway, here's the, like I would argue, is probably the third major plot point, and it's right here. You keep, uh, keep roll, it, roll it, Georgie, you put the sound down. Because you can barely understand him anyway, because he's got food in his mouth. Actually, run it up a little bit, Georgie, here, so we can get through this quickly. Use it as a no, no, run. Sound down, speed up. You know, you got enough to go. Yeah, here we go. Right here. Same principles at work. Rising action transitioning to the next act. And that's exactly what you get here with the bar fight. After this long scene of extended interior paranoia, the bar fight releases tension and then he looks out the window and what happens? Wrong guy again. Non-diegetic music moves in. Mood music, in other words. Who could it be? Who could it be? And we're all playing this game, too. We're all looking for clues on their, the, their boots, the scuffs on the boots. Are the are are uh, blue jeans frayed? We're all asking these same questions. Who could it possibly be? And then all of a sudden, poof. Again, the story takes a different path. And that's your third plot point. Okay? Okay, turn the sound down. Uh, yeah, I don't know how he runs this far, because he, he just keeps running and running and running, and he's wanting to stop. You're not going to make it, so stop, but he doesn't do it. Okay, again, now I'll go back to snake Arama again, 5540, and I'll just note this is the next plot point. And what makes it a plot point here is, again, the shift in the story. When you look at the scene, here is a medicine wagon, here is a Conestoga wagon, there's coyotes here, there's rattlesnakes, there's Gila monsters. This is crazy world. All of a sudden, the entire film starts to take on a very surreal, crazy atmosphere. 
And it all lifts up out of this one particular scene where he drives through the, through the, through the rattlesnakes and everything. It literally is the world gone insane. So we've seen a little bit of this far, so I won't take you, won't hold you here. Let's go to the next one, which I do want to investigate in a little bit of detail. And that's at uh, one, oh, one, minute, one hour and seven minutes and 30 seconds. Yes, back it up. Remember I was telling you to pay attention to the sound here? Watch this again right here. Just start playing there. And listen to the sound again. And listen to the way she says his name. She turns a one-syllable name into a two-syllable word. Jiyam. Well, in a way, yes. I wonder if you'd do me a favor. What's that? Uh, would you stop the nearest telephone you come to and call the police? Police? Yeah. You, you see that truck? Just that we don't want any trouble. No, no, no. There won't be any trouble. All I'm asking you to do is just call the police. Yes, ma'am. All I'm asking you to do is just make a phone call. Jim, step on the phone. My road. life's in danger. I can't you make a lousy truck. phone call to the lousy right. police for me? I love that. <laughs> and there's the Hitchcock. There's the Psycho music. There's the music from Psycho. Take it down, sound down. Now watch what happens here with the character. Here you get your last fundamental shift in the character and in the story. And Spielberg will again announce it with sound. Here is the truck baiting him. Now turn the sound up just a little bit, Georgie. Now what? Listen and watch. Triple cut. Cut one. Two. Three. And the, it announces to you. It's told you David Mann has just changed. Pause it. Look at the look on his face. His gesture, his whole prominence on his face has changed. Determination. And sure enough, I went and read the script. Turn on the lights here and I'll read it to you. Make sure I got the right one here. When I was looking at the script. Yeah, okay, yes. Let me make sure I've got it here. It's page uh, 67. This is the scene we've just seen. <sighs> Up a little bit more. Still coming at his car. Let me read the path, read the directions here. Make sure I've got it. Here it is, right here. <clears throat> here it is in the script. Man's thought, enough. Enough. Man's thought again. You have pushed me all you're going to. And then the directions. He draws himself erect, starts back to his car, walking slowly, resolutely, camera drawing ahead of him. We don't have to hear any interior monologue for this. Spielberg shows it to us. And not only does he show it to us, with the performance that Dennis Weaver gets, but he emphasizes it through the editing and the use of non-diegetic sound. Triple cut. Well, moving in, just like you do on the Western Hero, just like you did at John Wayne, you're zooming in. And, but Spielberg doesn't zoom in. He cuts in three times and announces the last two. Doing, doing. And if you don't believe it, it's re-emphasized at the end of the film. Go to uh, 1 minute 24 seconds. I mean, one hour, 24 minutes. Uh, 
uh, 124, run, run from 124 even. Right there. Yeah. There it again. Saw it? See it? Run it back. It's the same triple cut we had earlier. And this is the penultimate scene of action. Then here, and cut back to it, boom, boom, boom. Instead of zooming, he triple cuts. OK. So again, just to show you, that's Spielberg using a technique and has become, should be identified as a sort of leitmotif for determination. You see triple cut, you identify it with determination. Um, that takes us actually through all of the inciting incidents. Uh, but I wanted to get through and make sure you, you saw all of them there at the very end. I will show you one more. Go back to one, oh, one, minute, one hour, seven minutes, and 30 seconds again and run it up to where we left off, where he's just about to walk back to his car. Run up further, further, further. There. All non-diegetic sound at this point. And he's mixed so many things in there. Not just the mood music, but also sound effects. And then this. I love this. Alex, what do you see here? He's strapping himself in. He's like a fighter pilot. Yeah, absolutely. Again, it's a shift in the character. This is no longer the same character we were seeing earlier. The character has had a fundamental shift in what he is ready and willing to do. He's become, at this point, the Western hero, the romantic Western hero. OK, I'm tired. Uh, we did go through a lot today, but I hope it was sort of fun for you, meaningful. I don't know if it gave you any new information or not. But like I say, this is almost like having a textbook on making films, guys. There is so much in here. And we could actually talk about it for another hour, at least. OK. Thank you very much. It was nice having a chance to you. This movie, yeah, I, th I, I, think, I think you do see it. I think everybody sees it. We are following along. At this point in the film, we realize that this is a story about the development of this person. And this is really what makes it such an interesting movie. It's not about other people. It's not about David's relationship to other people. It's about David coming face to face with who he really is. And we are watching that as, a, as the audience, and I think the audience sees this transformation. I don't think it is subconscious. I think it's supposed to be overtly conscious for both David and the audience. David certainly has become more powerful in and of himself. 
So I, I would not think it's a subconscious. Again, it could be something, I don't know, maybe different cultures do see things differently, but I can tell you speaking from an American perspective, this is, this is Gary Cooper in High Noon strapping on the guns finally to go out and do the duel at the train, at the train station. That's what this is. And we have that clip too, but we don't have time to show it. <laughs> We can't do it. It's, it. It would destroy the fiction. And there is the one moment, I, we talked about it early in the film, there is the one moment where he does pass, and you sort of see, almost see the, 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 the driver. And when you, when you do think about it, it does have a sort of realism to it. How many times have you passed somebody in your car, and you look at them and you see them, but you really don't? After you've passed them, you couldn't tell me what they look like. Now. Down the road, after all this stuff has happened, yeah, you want to know who he looks like, but it's too late then because the truck will never let you look at him again. But there is that one opportunity he has, and they actually give us a little bit of that. We actually see a profile of the driver. It's still indistinguishable, but I think the reason is is because nobody notices. When you pass somebody on the road, you don't notice. I couldn't tell you. If I'm passing this truck, I wouldn't, you know... There's only one guy's face, since I've been over here, I can remember one face since I've been over here. It's that guy that was sitting out. No, 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 the guy downstairs in, in Central World. <laughs> it's when something sticks out at you like that, you remember it. Sort of misshapen. Remember where I told you, don't get distracted by that? Yeah, and I was, of course, distracted. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been, uh, been obsessing about it ever since I saw him. <laughs> yeah, wearing a blue, he's wearing a blue Hawaiian shirt, uh, black hair, weighs about 300 pounds. <laughs> yeah, he's ready for a police lineup. I can, I can put him in a police lineup right now. But normally you don't. I mean, think of all the other people I, I pass going, I can't tell you a single person I saw. That one sticks out. But that's realism, realistic, I think. Other questions? Okay. Okay. Well, thank you again.